much, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I particularly appreciate the invitation from the BIOS Centre to, uh, to listen to what I have to say. And, and I appreciate the fact that you've accommodated me with your scheduling. I know if you'd had your, um, your, your seminar at its normal time, it would have been in the middle of the night for me. And I couldn't promise that I would have given the best, <laughs> the best version of my presentation. So I'm grateful for your flexibility on that. I'll start by, if I can, sharing my screen because I have a PowerPoint presentation prepared. And well, thank you. So as you can <clears throat> see, the title today is Veils of Ignorance and a Self and Self-Aborting Fetuses, a response to Thompson. Uh, as you can probably gather, the Thompson I'm responding to is Judith Jarvis Thompson, who uh, very sadly passed away quite recently. And obviously the topic is on the subject somewhat of abortion. Now I want to start by saying that there are, that the moral permissibility of abortion is a very controversial topic. And it gives rise to many equally controversial questions. Uh, among them, as you can see on the screen, is a fetus a person? In the sense that I am a person and in the sense that all of you listening to me are people. If so, is it a person from conception or from some later time? For example, when its brainwaves start or perhaps at the sixth month of pregnancy or the seventh or the eighth. And likewise, does a fetus have a right to life? And if so, when does it obtain this right to life? Is it from conception or from implantation or at some later time? But even if we don't think that a fetus has a right to life or is a person, there are still lots of other very relevant questions. For example, does the fetus deserve protection as potential human life? Perhaps it's not a person now, and perhaps it doesn't have rights now, but perhaps there is something so special about what it will become if nurtured, that we have something of a moral obligation to nurture it and bring that reality about. As I said, these are all very important issues, but regardless of what we think on each of these, Today, we are going to be exploring the permissibility of abortion using what I'll call the ground rules, which are really the assumptions established by Judith Jarvis Thompson in her groundbreaking 1971 paper, A Defense of Abortion. And as you see on the screen, these, there are two of these. One, the fetus is a person from the moment of conception. And two, all people, including mothers and fetuses, have a right to life. Now, it's important to stress that we don't actually have to agree with these assumptions. And in fact, Thompson herself didn't agree with them. But it helps by using these as our ground rules, it helps us to evaluate her argument. Thompson essentially thought that there was too much focus on whether a fetus was a person and had rights that as a consequence, too little attention was paid to the implications of this personhood. In other words, people assumed that personhood would prohibit abortion, but the argument was not made out. Certainly it wasn't made out to Thompson's satisfaction. So Thompson did what I suppose any good philosopher would do, and that is that if your opponent has not um, clearly expressed their argument, you do it for them. And she came up with what she called the plausible sounding argument. And essentially she was interested in challenging the assumption that it automatically follows from a fetus's personhood that abortion is impermissible. And this plausible sounding argument essentially acts as her fall, as her foil, I should say. And the argument is this, every person has a right to life. So the, and I'm quoting Thompson now, so the fetus has a right to life. No doubt the mother has a right to, to decide what happens to in and to her body. 
Everyone would grant that, Thompson says. But surely a person's right to life is stronger and more stringent than the mother's right to decide what happens in and to her body. And so it outweighs it. The, so the fetus must, may not be killed and abortion may not be performed. This is the argument that Thompson developed for her opponents. Uh, it's important to stress at this point, I think, that I don't think this is a straw man argument. I, it's not an argument that is um, basically built just to be torn down. I, I think it, uh, this, the plausible sounding argument is prima facie quite plausible, certainly once we accept the premise that, of a fetus having a right to life. And I think it would gain widespread, although certainly not universal acceptance. But as you can see on the th screen, the three essential elements are really both the mother and fetus have a right to life. The mother also has a right to control her own body. However, the abortion is impermissible because the mother's right, because the um, fetus's right to life outweighs the mother's right to decide what happens in and to her body. And I think the key point for us at the moment is that person one's right to life outweighs what we might call person two's right to decide what happens in and to her body. <clears throat> so taking this as the plausible sounding argument that probably a lot of people intuitively have some sympathy with, Thompson basically thought, I want to challenge that. And so she came up with what's now a very famous thought experiment, the violinist example. And it's designed to challenge the assumption that I've just read out, the idea that a right to life outweighs or overrules a right to decide what happens to one's body. <clears throat> and the violinist example is this. You wake up in the morning and find yourself back to back in bed with an unconscious violinist. He has been found to have a fatal killed kidney ailment. You alone have the right blood type to help him. And last night, um, not very nicely, you were kidnapped and the violinist circulatory system was plugged into yours so that as well as, so that your kidneys could be used to extract poisons from the violinist's blood as well as your own. Now, the problem we have is this. If you stay connected to the violinist after nine months, he'll be fine, you'll be fine, and you can both go and carry on with your lives. However, if you disconnect from the violinist before nine months has passed, he will die. Now, effectively, Thompson's argument can be summarized in what I have up on the screen at the moment. And, and we'll see in a moment that she has a very strong intuition about the moral permissibility of disconnecting the abortion. But essentially her argument is this, if actions X and Y are relevantly similar, then action X is morally permissible if and only if action Y is morally permissible. Premise two, terminating a pregnancy is relevantly similar to disconnecting the violinist. Premise three, disconnecting the violinist is morally permissible. And therefore, conclusion, terminating a pregnancy is morally permissible. I should stress, however, that among other things, premise two is quite controversial. And some people believe that there are in fact very relevant differences between unplugging a violinist and having an abortion. One of which is the family relationship that exists between a mother and her fetus that doesn't exist between a kidnapped woman and a famous violinist. Another is the fact that most, certainly not all, but most fetuses are a result of a consensual act while the uh, person in hospital um, has been kidnapped, a non-consensual act, and also the fact that there may be relevant differences between killing and letting die. So that while in the violinist case, 
unplugging a violinist simply lets nature take its course. Uh, the actual practice of having an abortion is is a much more active way of, of disposing of the fetus. So I think these are all very important issues, and I, but I mentioned them mainly to emphasize that we're not going to be focusing on these today and that I don't propose to talk about them anymore. I think it's helpful sometimes to make clear what we're not going to talk about so it can help us be clear about what we are interested in. Not that we might not, might not be interested in those topics on another occasion. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'll give you now just a quick overview of the current paper. But I want to stress that in, in many ways, um, while Thompson constructs a very interesting argument for the permissibility of abortion, she doesn't really construct an argument or much of an argument for the permissibility of disconnecting the violinist. Uh, instead, her position on this is rather intuitive. She says, um, for example, that it's outrageous to think that a, someone could be compelled to stay connected to a violinist after being kidnapped and connected to them by force. Now, in this paper today, I propose to challenge Thompson's argument uh, by making two arguments of my own. The first of these is a contractarian argument that suggests that if we have an equal likelihood of being an unconscious violinist and an enforced kidney surrogate, then it is rational for us to stay connected to the, to the violinist. Uh, the other is what I call the self-aborting fetus scenario, um, which I'll discuss it more later, but essentially it's a, a thought experiment that reverses the dependence relationship that otherwise or that normally exists between a mother and her fetus. Let's talk for a moment about contractarianism and the veil of ignorance. Essentially, human beings are individuals, but they live in communities and they live in so within social structures. And unfortunately, it's pretty well established that people are often biased in their own favor. This may not be deliberate, but it is common. And likewise, even though people, not only are people biased in their own favor when um, involved in disputes, but people can have unequal bargaining power within those disputes. Some people are in a better position to get what they want than others, irrespective of the merits of, of the rights or wrongs involved. And moral contractarianism in summary, basically uses the um, metaphor of the social contract in order to determine rules for how people in a community ought behave and ought to behave to one another. Um, with an expectation that there'll be fairness involved, but also with the expectation that everyone will have at least some benefit from being in this social structure with these rules. And to help <clears throat> work out how we were going, how this social contract could, should be structured, uh, there's the hypothetical contract is thought to be, or should be negotiated behind what's called a veil of ignorance. So according to Rawls, for example, a veil of ignorance would be where we are ignorant of our own status, our own class, our own wealth, our abilities, our intelligence, and our strength. So it means, for example, that we might be making a decision about taxation, but without knowing whether we would be a rich person or a poor person. And likewise, it would mean that we, when we were deciding what legal rights to healthcare members of our community should have, we would be making that decision without knowing whether ourselves we were sickly or very healthy. So we create a position of ignorance. Now, I should stress at the outset that Rawls himself did not see the veil of ignorance as making abortion impermissible. Um, at least in part because for him, for him in his contract, uh, it was rational adults who were involved and not fetuses. Yet even if we accept this limitation, and I do think that there is some merit 
and that it would be a perfectly good construct even if we didn't just limit it to adults. I should note that at the moment we're focusing specifically on the violinist case and the violinist thought experiment only involves adults as participants. So in the violinist scenario, we know that there are two parties involved. Uh, Thompson tells us this, but she also makes it very clear which of the parties we, her readers, are. So, for example, she writes, imagine this, you wake up in the morning back to back with, a, with an unconscious violinist. So you know that you are the kidnapped person, uh, not the unconscious violinist. And really, not only in this case do you know which person you are, but you know what abilities you have. So you know of the you know of the power imbalance whereby you are in a position to disconnect from the violinist, even though the violinist is is not in a position to do anything much because he is unconscious. But what I think is useful, instead of being in this scenario where we know who the two people are, I think we should step back a moment and not know, deliberately not know which of the parties we are. <clears throat> and I think that the same thought experiment or essentially the same thought experiment can be framed from a position of ignorance. And I would say it would go something like this. Imagine you wake up one morning back to back in bed with another person. You do not know which person you are. What you do know, what, and this creates the position of ignorance. And other, other than the change I've made there, the scenario stands. One of these parties, the, these parties, their circulatory systems have been connected. Uh, one of them is depending on the other for nine months. Otherwise, that person will die. And from this position, but we don't know which of the two parties we are. And from this position of ignorance, but what we do know is that we have an equal chance of being the kidney surrogate and the uh, violinist. We also know that nine months of inconvenience is uh, preferable to death. And given only this information, we might be inclined then to think it's rational to create a general rule that would require remaining connected to the feet, to the, uh, to the violinist. Now, this works best if, uh, if we think it's a situation any of us could plausibly be involved in. So I suppose the more uh, unconscious you know, violinists with kidney failure we have in the, in the community who are being forcibly connected to people, perhaps it, it would make more sense then to think of it from this point of view. But essentially we're now in a situation where if that is all we know, I, I certainly contend quite strongly that it would be rational for us to want to remain, to enforce the connection because Hey, as I said, if I knew I was going to be, I would much rather gamble on not having nine months, losing a gamble and my loss being nine months of inconvenience than losing a gamble and my life being death. So it seems to me that that's quite rational. And of course, we can consider uh, the issue of, of abortion from the same perspective, a mother and a fetus. Now, and I should emphasize that while I developed this scenario um, to challenge Thompson on the violinist case, because her argument for the permissibility of abortion essentially relies on her strong intuition in the violinist case. Uh, nevertheless, it applies, I think, directly to abortion, where if we go back to the next screen, it perhaps makes a reasonable difference or a very fundamental difference to how we think about an abortion situation if we knew that we were involved as one of the parties, the mother or the fetus, but we didn't know which one we were. Now, so what are the benefits and the challenges of approaching the violinist case and abortion more broadly uh, from the perspective of the veil of ignorance? I'm going to focus on one benefit 
I think, of, of my way of looking at it, and also one, one challenge. And the benefit basically is this, I, I haven't covered this so far, but one of the key challenges or arguments that Thompson makes against the plausible sounding argument is not merely that it obligates a woman to remain connected to a fetus for the duration of a nine month pregnancy, but that the same argument effectively would obligate in a hypothetical scenario, the woman to remain connected to the fetus or to the violinist for that matter, for the rest of her life, which could be many decades. After all, according to the plausible sounding argument, a fetus's right to life would always outweigh the mother's right to do what she wants with her body. Uh, and I think this leaves us, if we accept Thompson on this, I think this leaves us with two, or if we accept this assumption, it leaves us with two unattractive alternatives. One of which is that the fetus's right to life obliges the mother to stay connected, which means she would have to stay connected even if it required her to stay connected for many decades. And the other is that the other option seems to be that the fetus's right to life does not obligate the mother to stay connected at all, uh, in which case she could have an abortion even if she only needed to nurture the child for a few more minutes or a few more days or hours. But I suggest that viewing the problem from behind a veil of ignorance helps us avoid both of these extremes because the behind the veil question would become something like, would I rather the certainty of a lifetime stuck to another human being or have a 50% chance of a full life? And it seems to me that for contractarians, there would come a point which would be longer than nine months, but would be much shorter than a human lifetime where the inconvenience to the mother or kidney surrogate combined with the lack of meaningful existence otherwise would weigh in favor of termination. And therefore it might be rational to stay connected for nine months, but not necessarily rational to stay connected for 30 years because I think there comes a point when most people would opt for all or nothing, for the all or nothing option, which is basically you get a full life or you die rather than have both people out of action for an extended period of time. It might be, for example, that I think, yeah, look, I'm, I'm prepared, certainly happy to spend, risk spending nine months um, attached to a violinist or a fetus in a hospital bed if, um, if that meant that I also don't have to avoid dying. But sometimes it'll get to the point, where I think, where most people think, you know what, we're talking about many, many years now. I'd just rather take, I, I, I'll take the odds on this one. I've got a 50-50 chance, and I'd rather the 50-50 chance of, just a 50% chance of living than the certainty of living for many years connected to someone else in a bed. So I think I, I couldn't tell you now what I think people would exactly what figure of how many, how many months or, or years people would agree to, but I think there would come a point where most people would decide that it was rational not to continue with the connection. <clears throat> so that I think is probably the most obvious benefit of, of my approach to the issue. Uh, there has been a challenge raised. I don't know if I mentioned this at the start, but uh, many of the points I'm making here today were published in an article I had in um, the Journal of Medical Ethics earlier in the year. And so far there has been one response to my paper, which is on this issue of the veil of ignorance. Uh, you'll, you'll forgive me if I get the person's name wrong, the pronunciation, Juna Rassanen is how um, it looks to me to be pronounced, but I, I suspect that, that I've got that a little bit wrong. <clears throat> but regardless, what Rassanen um, hopes it comes up with is, is a thought experiment that is essentially designed to challenge what I put forward to you. And the thought experiment is, involves an organ lottery where, and I'll quote Rassanen now, whenever a person is suffering from kidney failure and is destined to die, society draws out a lottery. 
a suitable person is looked up and for nine months, his or her body will be used to save the kidney patient, after which uh, the donor is free to go. Now, interestingly, I think, Rassanen actually says that rationally we should accept this policy. We should expect, accept the policy of the organ lottery for the simple reason that you cannot know whether it will be your kidneys that fail or not. And that, um, yeah, the inconvenience of being hooked up for nine months is preferable to death. However, he also points out that in practice, people are unlikely to agree to the lottery. As he says, and I quote, we do not currently force people, we do not currently force people to donate kidneys, even though most kidney donors can return to normal daily activities after two to four weeks, which is, end quote, which is clearly a, a much shorter period than nine months. He points out that in real life, we don't force people to become stem cell donors. Uh, again, given the relative, even given the relative lack of <clears throat> um, inconvenience involved compared to the benefit. And he concludes, unless we are willing to revise the current practices and force people to become stem cell donors, we can reasonably allow women to have abortions as well. Now I have two main responses to make to Rassanen's argument. Firstly, I think there is some merit to the argument, but I also think that he is arguing against the contractarian concept of the veil of ignorance itself, rather than specifically my application of it. So in a sense, I think that the argument perhaps belongs somewhere else. It, it's relevant to the wider issue of abortion. It's not necessarily relevant to the, if, you know, the purpose of applying a contractarian position to, to, um, to abortion is usually if someone has weight, if someone already has some sympathy for contractarianism, which it sounds like he doesn't, which is, which is obviously fine. Um, but secondly, uh, in respect to his organ donor lottery scenario, and again, I'll quote him again, he states, rationally, we should adopt such a policy, but I doubt that people would agree to it in such a practice, uh, end quote. Uh, to that I say, well, perhaps, but I'm more interested in what people rationally should do than in what they do in practice. Um, further, it's not clear to me that the generic people he refers to have actually considered any of these issues from behind a genuine veil of ignorance. So I'm not really sure that his, his argument undermines my position. I mean, it's well known that people are bad at judging likelihood in rare cases, um, which is what the average person does presumably when considering these issues. Um, but behind a veil of ignorance, I expect that while we'd be ignorant about our own position, we would have access to um, relevant objective facts. So I, I think that if he concedes that it is rational, that perhaps more people would realise it was rational if they did actually approach the issue from behind a veil of ignorance, rather than just from the uh, perspective of everyday life. <clears throat> so that's, that's essentially the end of the first argument that I make regarding the veil of ignorance. And now I want to go on and discuss my um, thought experiment of the self aborting fetus. And uh, to start with though, I want to make what is probably a very obvious point, which is that in typical pregnancies, the fetus is dependent on the mother. And in the PowerPoint presentation, that's, that's what that blue arrow suggests. The fetus is dependent on the mother. Further, when we consider the issue of abortion, we do so knowing that the fetus depends on the mother and that the mother does not depend on the fetus. And I think this is an, actually an important point uh, because Thompson's ground rules establish that both the mother and the fetus have a right to life. The mother also has a right to control her body. And although Thompson doesn't expressly state this, presumably the fetus also has a right to do what it wants with its own body. After all, Thompson was assuming that it was a person with a right to life. In practice, however, only the fetus is in a state of dependency and only the mother can exercise her right to bodily autonomy. 
Um, so we might think that these are convenient truths for mothers when determining the permissibility of abortion. Uh, but consequently, I, I wanted to develop a thought experiment where we flip this around. So what uh, these ordinary realities, the ordinary fact that the mother, that the fetus depends on the mother and not vice versa, versa is flipped and see what happens then. And so that's what the self-aborting fetus example does. And as you can see on the, uh, on the screen, the arrow is now pointing in the other direction. So the thought experiment is, goes as follows. Imagine a possible world where with one exception, human reproduction occurs as it does in our world. So in this world, post-pubescent women become pregnant as a result of intercourse with post-pubescent men and a full-term pregnancy lasts about nine months. The one exception is this. A small proportion of fetuses in this world outpace the physical and mental development of their peers. And after only three months, they may have a perfectly viable existence outside the womb. Furthermore, remaining in the womb after this point causes these fetuses a modest amount of ongoing discomfort. But thankfully, nature has provided them with an option. They can self-abort, after which they will have viable lives free from uh, discomfort within the womb. Unfortunately, while a self-abortion is beneficial to the fetus, it is fatal to the mother, who as a consequence of nourishing a fast-growing fetus becomes deficient in an essential nutrient, um, this deficiency would be unproblematic if, uh, if the pregnancy lasted full term because the mother would receive the nutrient via the connected circulatory system that she shares with the, with the fetus. Uh, if, however, a self-abortion occurs prior to the nine-month mark, then the mother dies and no viable medical options exist to save her once a self-abortion has occurred. However, in, as I present the scenario, there is one option available to the mother. Once the self-abortion commences, she may take medicine to suppress it. Uh, taking the medicine will mean that the self-abortion is prevented, the pregnancy will continue as normal, and that she will give birth to a healthy baby around nine months mark of her pregnancy. Very importantly for the mother, her life will have been saved, and the only downside in the whole scenario is that the fetus will have continued to feel discomfort for the intervening six months and would have had a delay of six months to what could would otherwise have been an earlier start to its life. So the questions that I think it's interesting to look at here is firstly is it morally permissible for the mother medically to suppress the self-abortion and two is it morally permissible for a third party, for example, her doctor, to assist her? Now, I, I'll be interested later when we have this discussion to hear what everyone other else's intuitions say about this. But to me, the intuitive answer is very clearly yes. And, and I'll even use Thompson's word outrageous and suggest that it seems outrageous to prioritise the short-term discomfort of the fetus over the mother's life. Nevertheless, the scenario has flipped the dependence relationship that exists in regular abortions. The mother now depends on the fetus's body for her survival, while the fetus needs nothing from the mother at all, other than uh, unimpeded passage out. So, it's, so in this case, it becomes the mother and not the fetus who is in the position equivalent to Thompson's violinist. As I said, we all have our own intuitive responses to this, I'm sure. It's interesting to know what Thompson would think. I also mentioned that she has sadly passed away, so we'll never know for sure. But I think there are some clues in her work. And specifically, I focus on one quote where she says, having a right to life <clears throat> does not guarantee having either a right to be given the use of another person's sorry, either the right to be given 
or the right to be allowed continued use of another person's body, even if one needs it for life itself. So I think this makes it quite clear that um, Thompson would have, whatever her intuitions would have been, her position would have committed her to holding that the mother had no right to prevent the self-abortion. So that's what I think Thompson would be committed to thinking. But um, what about us? Um, what should we think? Well, I should stress that we are only facing an inconsistency if we believe it's okay to prevent a self-abortion, but not okay to prevent a regular abortion. So we can actually, like everyone, is, as I said, Thompson, it's perfectly possible for Thompson to have perfectly consistent views on this. She might say, yes, it's perfectly permissible for a woman to disconnect from a violinist. Yes, it's per perfectly permissible for a woman to have an abortion. And yes, it's perfectly permissible for a um, for an advanced fetus to initiate a, um, a self-abortion, even though that will kill the mother. So it's perfectly possible to be consistent on this. It's only if um, if we have if we want to maintain conflicting views that um, that we have a problem. <clears throat> And we might think that, and so we might want to <clears throat> go with the view that I think Thompson would be committed to holding that the self-abortion is permissible. But likewise, we might want to stick with our own intuition and think that preventing the self-abortion is perfectly permissible despite the discomfort it'll cause to the fetus. I, I for one, am inclined to stick with that intuition. After all, it does seem highly problematic to me to prioritise the fetus's short-term discomfort over the mother's life. And even the contractarian position I developed earlier would permit taking the medicine to prevent the self-abortion behind the veil of ignorance where the only options are being a pregnant woman or a fetus, the disparity between six months of modest discomfort on the one hand and death on the other, to me, makes it the only rational option. But I, I do want to spend a moment considering a couple of possible responses to the uh, self-aborting fetus scenario. Specifically, I want to consider the possibility that there is a relevant difference between a mother deciding to abort and a fetus to deciding to abort. We might think, for example, we might focus on the biological or genetic relationship that exists between the two and think that um, the fetus has some special obligation to its mother. It's not just any old woman, it's, it's the fetus's mother. But I think we can pretty easily dismiss this possibility. After all, if the relationship between them does not obligate the mother um, to see a pregnancy to full term, then why should it obligate the fetus? And But secondly, we might think that the location of the fetus <clears throat> is a relevant factor. The fetus, after all, is in the mother. And Thompson told us very clearly that a mother has a right to control her own body. But I don't think this works either. And I think that for this reason, uh, I haven't mentioned this already, but those of you who are familiar with Thompson's paper might remember <clears throat> that she also had a thought experiment regarding a rapidly growing child. The, the scenario is that imagine you're in, in a small house, a very small house with a rapidly growing child, and that if you don't kill the child, the child will expand to the point that it kills you against the walls. Uh, Thompson was using that example as a case to look at the issue of self-defense. But I wonder what if instead of killing the person, the rapidly growing child actually absorbed an innocent woman into its womb, into its, into, 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 inside it, not necessarily its womb, but the, I'll say that again. So the rapidly growing child absorbs an innocent woman who then exists inside it. Would the child obtain 
any additional authority over the woman because she is inside it. To me, that seems implausible. So if the rapidly growing child wouldn't have any additional authority over a woman it absorbs because the woman's inside it, it seems implausible to me to think that a woman would have any additional authority over a fetus that happens to exist inside her. So I don't think the location works as a point of difference either. <clears throat> So I'm very close to the end now, and I, I just want to leave you all with what I'd call a fi some final thoughts, which ties together a few of the scenarios that we've been looking at. So imagine this. A pregnant woman wakes up one morning to find herself, surprise, surprise, at this point, back to back in bed with an unconscious violinist. A doctor tells her that the violinist will die if she unplugs him, Nevertheless, she is about to pull the plug when suddenly she feels a pang that announces that her fetus is intending to self-abort, which she knows will result in her death. The same doctor tells her that he can give her a drug that will suppress the abortion and force the fetus to remain inside her for six months, thus saving her life. So the question I leave you all with, it, with is this. Given that we are operating from the assumption that each of the three parties, I just realized I forgot to go to my final slide, sorry. Given that we're operating from the assumption that each of the three parties involved, the fetus, the woman, and the violinist has the same right to life, and also presumably the same right to bodily autonomy, can it credibly be argued that the woman and her doctor are entitled simultaneously to unplug the violinist and suppress the abortion. Uh, to me, it seems no. If it is justifiable, I argue, to stop the self-abortion, then it is not justifiable to unplug the violinist. Alternatively, if it is justifiable to unplug the violinist, then it is not justifiable to stop the self-abortion. So thank you very much, everyone. That is, that is my paper. I, I hope you found it um, hopefully thought provoking. And I'm keen, very keen now to hear what you have to say about it, whether you have some questions or some challenges for me. I'll <clears throat> exit. I'll exit uh, sharing screen mode so that uh, you can possibly get a better view of me when we're talking. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I realised I was muted uh, for that interesting presentation. Uh, would anyone like to kick off the discussion? Uh, if not, maybe I could um, uh, say a few things. Um, Please do. One thing that occurred to me was that, was that, in a sense, the woman's body is implicated in, in any exit of the fetus, because presumably what this imaginary adult fetus wants to do is to make the, the mother's body uh, expel it. Yes. Um, and, and so I suppose that's a bit of a difference because if the woman is trying to prevent that, she's trying to prevent the fetus from making her body expel it. So even though, even though she's also focused on the body of the fetus, it's in relation to an action of her own body that she wants to prevent. Um, so I, I'm just wondering if that's if that's um, a, a relevant difference here. Yeah, look, it it could be. I I think it depends probably on how you you look at it. I, I mean, Thompson <clears throat> likes using the idea of the woman's body being the equivalent of her house. So it's her house. She has a right to decide sort of what happens in in her house, but. I, I suppose I, I'd use the analogy here that I might have the right to decide what I do in my house, but I don't have the right to keep someone else in my house against their will. And I, I, I think I'd suggest that that would be what would be happening in this case, that you would have 
a fetus that has a right to life and a right to um, bodily autonomy wanting to leave, wanting to exercise that autonomy by leaving but being constricted and forced to remain so um, so I, that, that's probably that's the first thing I would say secondly uh, <clears throat> I, I'll go back to the my version of the, the rapidly growing child um, and, and and I think we'd want to consider as I said, it's not the case, I think, that there's one right or wrong view here. I think it, what is it, it is the case is that it's important that we're consistent between the views. And I think that we'd want to, if we're taking the line of argument that you made, I think we'd want to ask ourselves, what would we, if a rapidly growing child did absorb a woman and the rapidly, and the woman was then stuck inside it, would the woman have the right to exit? Uh, now we're not talking about a scenario in which one's life depends on the other as such, but would she have the right to exit? And I think I think she probably would in that case. So in which case I'm also inclined, I think that reinforces my thought that the that the fetus would also, uh, the, the fact that it's... Uh, does, I mean, I must say, I, I, I struggle quite a bit with the, mm -hmm. with both this and Thompson, because as you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier in the, in the talk, there's this, there's so many different things going on with pregnancy, not just the, the family relationship, but yeah. also, of course, the fact that this is a non, non pathological connection from which we've all benefited mm -hmm. ourselves. Um, and then there's the fact that, uh, then there's the, the fact that, um, separating the two, um, unlike in the case of the violinist, um, as, as Thompson originally um, imagined it, was, would involve um, a, a, some kind of lethal bodily invasion of, of, uh, of one party, you know, an actual action on that, that party's own tissues in many, in many cases. And so many things are, are, are not the same. Um, but, but if it were just literally a violinist case, so being side by side with a, with a stranger who, who you were supporting. Um, I think there's many things that could entitle you to separate yourself uh, because in that case, you could have more duties to others than to the stranger. So, so you know, perhaps you're, you're not doing anything more important. Perhaps you're, you're unemployed or retired yeah. or whatever. Uh, perhaps in that case, you should, you know, step up to the plate and look after the violinist. But maybe you're you're someone who you lose access to your children if you stay connected. So that's not death, but that's a pretty serious kind of outcome. Um, so so I think when we consider things like things like compulsory organ donation or compulsory being compuls um, that's a slightly separate issue because it involves a um, uh, harmful invasion of your body. Um, but when we consider other kinds of support or connection. Uh, mm -hmm. All sorts of things come into play, I think, that don't come into play in the in this very basic parental relationship that is that is pregnancy. Yeah. You know, something from yeah. which we've we, uh, we've all we all derive mm -hmm. benefit every day, mm -hmm. uh, simply because we've been we've been born ourselves. Yeah, actually, no, I think that's a very interesting point that you make about the other obligations that um, that say the person connected to the the violinist might have, and I suppose the implication that it is more likely to obligate unemployed people with no family <laughs> to stay connected to the violinist than than other people. And I can imagine scenarios where, you know, it, everything weighs in. I'm in hospital, I'm trapped, but I am. Well, I decide I'm going to stay connected to the violinist because, you know, his life and mine, it, it works out better that way. And then suddenly I see two people in need of being saved. So I decide, well, if I stay connected to the violinist, I'm only saving one person. Disconnect, I can save two. So that changes the equation. Um, I think though, I think I'd probably make the broader point that it, it is, it is a um, simplistic scenario and I think necessarily a simplistic scenario. If we were looking at, at it, however, from the perspective of the veil of ignorance, I think we could factor in all these other considerations. 
you know, I, I think we could, I think people could rationally behind the veil decide what they would do in, you know, X, Y, Z cases. Um, okay, this is what you should do if you're attached to one violinist. This is what you should do if you are attached to a violinist, but you have, but you and only you can save the lives of some other people or only you, you and only you can go and do other things. Um, and I suppose as a, if we're looking at it from the perspective that we're looking at a social contract and how and how our, we should relate to all other people in our community, we might think that the, the, the community would step up to the plate at that point and so that if, okay, unfortunately, you know, Matthew's been connected to an unlock. You know, it, it'd just be, it, it, I minded it would work where you have people, where people can call in and, you know, why are you calling in sick today? And, you know, I've got a cold, I've got a fever, and look, I got connected to an unconscious violinist overnight. I imagine it could become a, a bit of a routine issue. And then it, it would be the case where the rest of society then steps up to the plate. It knows that I'm the only one whose circulatory system is a perfect match for the violinist. So I'm the only one who can save him but plenty of other people can fulfill my other obligations in life. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I, I also struggle with the, um, with the whole um, veil of ignorance thing, because mm -hmm. um, sometimes it starts to sound like it's what you would like to happen. Now you might like yep. to happen all sorts of things which you wouldn't mm -hmm. consider to be just. You know, yeah. I might be quite happy if I woke up and someone had kidnapped a stranger and given me all their organs but that doesn't mean that's a that's a just, yeah, no, exactly. a just thing to do so um so yes but I, I don't want to take up too much too much time but um it's all very interesting um any other uh, comments uh, sure can i add something yes please do sure um i guess i'm probably a bit sympathetic to Razanin's uh, lottery point of view in that uh behind the veil of ignorance i mean any of us could get a kidney disease and and need a kidney and um you know we could all go in the lottery and be forced to donate a kidney if we uh win or, or lose the lottery as it were i mean that's rational but i think that's rational from actually from a utilitarian point of view um that's where the rationality is derived from so from a utilitarian point of view i guess that's kind of rational and but um like resonance says i don't think many people really want to live in a society where we're forced to donate organs or various other things by a lottery system that's not terribly appealing to me and to probably to a lot of other people so i think i am a bit sympathetic there um in terms of the veil of ignorance i mean i would have thought a simpler approach is to say uh, one in three babies is aborted um, would you prefer to live in a society where abortion was legal or not given that you know you could easily be one of those children that uh, is aborted and a more direct appeal to the veil of ignorance just whether abortion should be legal or not you know, I know rules kind of his veil of ignorance is, is talking about persons but I also do know he kind of gets himself tied in knots a bit with infants he is kind of forced to concede that infants are persons as far as he's concerned to make sure infanticide is not permissible which he doesn't want to happen and so he does concede that being potentially rational also also fits with his description of person which kind of means fetuses are persons as far as rules is concerned as well so i, I would be tempted on that point of view i guess on the self-aborting fetus, which I, I think it's a really cool thought experiment. I think, it, I think it's great. It kind of turns your intuition around completely. Uh, I wonder whether the intuition is because we're inclined to not really treat fetuses as moral agents or have any agency at all. And so, of course, we think the mother should be able to survive because it's only a fetus. I just wonder whether that uh, attribution to agency comes into it, and that's why the, that's why fetuses get short, short short changed in our laws so much is because we don't 
we don't sort of see them as persons. We or our, our intuitions is because we don't we we can't actually see their faces. We can't. They don't. You know, they're not rational. They don't. They can't move much on their own accord. They can't speak. I wonder whether that feeds a lot into our intuitions about what we think is permissible. And so, of course, women can't allow the self-aborting fetus because um, they their lives need to be preserved over everything else. Yeah. Anyway, that's just a thought there. But um, I, I've, I think it's a great thought experiment and uh, I find it really interesting. I noticed uh, Razanen didn't tackle it either. No, um, he had a, there was a footnote in his paper saying that he might tackle it somewhere else. So I'm keen to see what he, what he does have to say about it. Uh, but, I, but I do, I, I'm quite sympathetic and agree with what you were, were saying in that, and I mean, I'll even go one step further in that you're right, not only is it um, perhaps difficult to see the fetus as a person, but even when we're explicitly having an argument with Thompson's ground rules, which is, hey, whatever you think normally, for the sake of today's discussion, for the sake of this argument, we're assuming that the fetus is a person. Even then, I think that, uh, that people struggle to really get the full implication of that, which again is why I think it's useful to reverse things around as we did with the self-aborting fetus. Um, yeah, I think, I think you're right on that. We can't switch off our intuitions that easily just because we're making this assumption that the fetus is a person that still colours our intuitions. And um, yeah, I think, I mean, the whole person thing is unfortunate in that we tend to conflate person with the, the common sense use of person anyway and agency and all that kind of stuff. And that's not what we really mean by person in this sense when we're talking about moral persons anyway. So anyway, thanks. It was a really interesting talk. Yeah, an interesting thought, you know, it would be yeah, what would people have a different attitude if it was a fully formed mini human inside the mother rather yeah, than from, a, from fertilization yeah that would be yeah, that you could see like a little person with a top hat or something in there in the womb and you can actually see his face and he's having his thoughts and he's possibly debating philosophy or whatever he's doing and you can actually tell that yeah this is not just something that looks a little bit like a, a human like as a fetus does but this is wow this is just a person if you take a if you get your MRIs or X-rays done. Yes, it is just a an homunculi, essentially a small mini person. Maybe then we, we'd have some different intuitions, perhaps. Yeah, um, Perry, Perry Hendricks has written a good paper on the uh, embryo rescue argument about our intuitions about rescuing embryos over over children and that kind of thing. And he points out that uh, cognitive science does show that we have intuitions about uh, self repelled things that we attach value to so that we naturally will want to rescue a child over embryos because embryos are not self-propelled with their own agency and so that basically means that kind of thought experiment is pretty useless for anything really because the answer is already built in through our you know our attaching moral value to to self-propelled agents yeah i can see that i wonder i, I mean i think there are probably other variables there. I'm just sort of thinking that arguably a, a newborn baby also isn't particularly self-propelled, but no, um, you would often favour it over a 50-year-old man or a 70-year-old uh, woman. Yeah, we'd probably save the baby from a burning building and before we'd save either of them, perhaps, but there are lots of other variables, I'm sure. Yeah, that was Rawls's problem, I think, with his definition of persons that he really did not want infanticide to be um, be permissible. So he yeah, came well, out that, that, it's hard to be <laughs> it's hard to be too uh, uh, criticise too harshly someone who doesn't want to permit infanticide. No, absolutely, yeah, yeah, uh, as opposed to a lot of other philosophers who are, are quite happy to endorse that. May I, comment? May I just uh, ask you something? Because um, uh, in the example of the self-aborting self fetus, basically we, uh, we have to balance the right to life, uh, the women's mm -hmm. right to life, and um, the fetus 
discomfort. And mm -hmm. of course, I mean, the right to life outweighs the discomfort of the fetus. But what if uh, we have to balance uh, the right to life of the fetus and the right to life of the woman in the okay. sense, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, the, the woman as a, as a cancer and the fetus, uh, we are sure that uh, he has the right match of the bone marrow that uh, the, the pregnant woman needs. So they, they, in this circumstance, we are not talking about, uh, there is no option of self-aborting, but uh, we, we know for sure that uh, the fetus needs uh, the pregnant woman to uh, come to life and the mm -hmm. woman needs the fetus to live afterwards. And um, they both have uh, the right to control their own body. Mm -hmm. And um, and um, how can um, how can you balance uh, these uh, two circumstances in the sense that uh, when it comes, I mean, it to me looks quite um, easily. I mean, when we have to balance life and discomfort, uh, mm -hmm. comes pretty easy what you have to outweigh. But when it comes to both right to life, both, uh, I mean, when it's more difficult to outweigh these rights, how can we deal with that? And mm -hmm. the other thing is that, of course, nobody has the right to use your body unless you give him this right. So mm -hmm. when you when you do uh, the example of the fetus, we have to, and I just need this clarification because it's true that it's very hard to think about a fetus as a person. So we yeah. are talking about a person and not the fetus must be compared to an adult person able to uh, explain uh, his own will. Is it is it correct? Look, I, I think so. Whatever. Um... I, I think we're operating within Thompson's ground rules. I, I think we can be a little open-minded about what it is, but whatever it is about me, a 41 year old man that makes me a person and that gives me a right to life, whatever that is also applies to the, the fetus in this scenario. And I think okay. so, whatever, so whatever it is, that's important about okay. me. Okay, because uh, now that you were talking, I was, uh, let's uh, think that uh, the violinist, I mean, uh, the woman uh, the, uh, who is attached to the violinist, uh, okay, needs uh, the bone marrow of that violinist. So he needs him to live in order her to live. But, uh, uh, and uh, this is one thing. The other thing is that uh, she doesn't want to stay connect with him because, uh, uh, I mean, she he doesn't own anything to him. So, I mean, maybe I'm just uh, getting more confused. But uh, my I I really um, my difficult is uh, to balance uh, two rights. How can we deal with that? I mean, if we think they both have the right to life, how can we deal with that? Because it's easier when, even when you talk with the stranger of people not in the field, it's very much easier to, um, to outweigh the life, right to life to, to discomfort. I mean, but... Uh, I think one... Again, looking at it from from Thompson's perspective, one thing she does say is that a right to life isn't 
a right not to be killed as such. It's a, it's a right not to be unjustly killed. So you, it could be that you, um, you start bringing in the issue of the justness of a, of a particular action, um, which, yeah, am I, you know, you know, killing someone in self-defense on the one hand, killing someone by failing to be a good Samaritan in the other. Um, and, and then killing someone by just being downright nasty. I suppose you've got a few different, different options there. So perhaps we could, I mean, we'd have to flesh it out a bit more, but perhaps, yeah, the idea of, and this might be the case in, in the scenario, I'm not sure if I get them 100% the, I 100% understand the scenarios you were talking about, say with the pregnancy one, where they both depend on on the other to some extent. But it might be that we we decide that one action is is a more just use of of the other than than, than not potentially. Okay. Potentially. Um, um, yeah. And I'm possibly an interesting aside, but I know um, and Thompson was talking too about. the right to, and again, I'm not, not entirely sure I understand fully your, your examples, but um, so you might need to explain them again to me, but with if Thompson does say that we don't have a right to, the mother doesn't have a right to kill the fetus as such, she has a right to have the abortion because that's what essentially is the act of disconnecting but that if um, if the fetus somehow survived the abortion, the mother doesn't then have the option of finishing it off. Um, she then it's still a person with a right to life, and then it would presumably have the same rights to medical care that uh, that any other person in our in our community would have. So um, yeah, so I think so. The location of the fetus is fundamental. I mean, the fact that the fetus is located inside the, women, the woman's body, it's yep. essential because once uh, if uh, an abortion doesn't go well in the sense that the fetus survive, the mother doesn't have any right on him anymore because it's outside her body. Yes, that, that's right. Okay. Yeah. I think that well, yeah, that's certainly what um, you know, what Thompson was of the view. I mean, she made the point that um, some people who decide they want abortions would nevertheless be very unhappy with the idea of having one of their descendants. So perhaps you could imagine a woman would thinking um, she doesn't want children, um, and she might you know, have the abortion not simply because she doesn't perhaps want to look after the child, but simply because she doesn't want to have children at all, and therefore a um, you know, a child who is alive, a living descendant of hers, which is something she'd be unhappy with. But yes, if if by chance the child did survive the abortion, which Thompson thinks would be permissible for the mother to have, she has no more, um, yeah, she, she can't do anything. She can't, as I said, finish the child off at that point. She can't um, have it, the child put down or anything like that. It's It's now alive. Yeah, and, and there is the presumption that he's a person. So, and it's a person. yep, again, once and as I said, everything we've been discussing like today an adult person with a will, and uh, yeah, yeah, she don't, I don't think she specifically says that, but yeah, I, I just from, from my point of view, I think we have to decide if we're going to do the, the thought experiment properly, we have to accept that whatever it is we think is important about us as adults, that and yeah. the person as an adult makes that child. Yeah. So, if it means it's a rational being, you know, having lots of philosophical thoughts and for the purpose of the argument, I think so. Be. Yeah, because then uh, you can uh, think about, uh, I mean, postnatal uh, abortions and the fact that uh, the, the fetus anyway depends, uh, let's say, to the woman body in the sense that, uh, for instance, uh, you cannot, uh, there is no formula in the world that he needs to be breastfed. So there is the need... Uh, I mean, this fetus is going to depend on the woman body again. Yeah. Yeah, and then I suppose you, you get into a whole lot of uh, issues at that point about um, obligations to care for people who 
who can't look after themselves. So I, I think we get a whole lot of issues. Yeah, yeah, there. sure, sure. But uh, even though the fetus is outside the body, it, uh, we can, even that circumstance, see it's a very uh, a, a link to the woman body anyway, in order to the fetus to survive. I mean, but yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Great, guys. Um, Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, um, I've just got a few sort of uh, unformed thoughts, I suppose. Um, being a scientist by trade and, and not a philosopher, um, thinking back about the trajectory of what we've learnt about fetal life mm -hmm. in the last 100, 200 years, that's been a progressive story of unveiling a degree of complexity and mystery uh, that, that we really had no idea was there. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question is that, and it sort of goes to the question of what persons are and that you talk about that kind of mysterious thing that whatever makes us the person, mm -hmm. what, is it, what is that thing? What if we were in the future, through our scientific endeavours or whatever, uh, to really discover things about fetal life, which were um, what we would now consider quite mind-blowing and more evidence of um, some sort of rationality or some sort of thought life or some sort of uh, internal awareness. And I suppose I'm also thinking here of the end of life and, and all the sorts of scenarios where the question of persons comes up again, um, where whatever that thing is that makes us a person can be reduced right down to something that is still there in the uh, completely non-responsive patient. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just wonder, do we, do we need to leave some sense of openness with not necessarily going to the noetic or spiritual about mm -hmm. fetal life and what could potentially be there? I know yeah. it's a bit... Well, I, I think, <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I think that's, a, I think that's a, good, a good question. I think it's an important question. Um, I think that... So I mean, so I mean, in some ways, my my presentation's really about Thompson as such, and and, and evaluating mm, yeah. her argument, obviously within it within its direct context, rather than more broadly. For just, I'll, I'll talk about what you you suggested in a moment. But um, I mean, for example, she said, for the sake of argument, that uh, if the you know, fetus would be a, have a right to life from conception, she didn't actually believe that. Nevertheless, she did think that it was some time before birth that mm -hmm. the the, if the fetus gained its personhood and had a right to life, even if it was hard to to identify the point. But you're quite right; it is um, certainly very hard to to work out at, at which point. Um, mm. And I don't know. My thinking is that yeah, I, I suppose um, there are a couple of things I would think. One is, yeah, to what extent should you? apply the benefit of the doubt if you're mm. if there's if, if it's not just uncertainty but there's credible uncertainty about what as you say in what mental life a, a fetus might have for example if that if that's the case that there's a level of uncertainty you know you might want to apply a, a level of you know give some benefit of the doubt there is the same way we would in in making lots of other you know lots of other decisions um i'm just sort of trying to think if Say I was a, um, a firefighter and I wanted to do some some back burning. Yeah, how confident would I want to be that there was no people in the back burning mm -hmm. area before I lit I lit the fire? You know, what level of confidence would I want? Do I, do I want to just assume there's no one there? Do I want to do a quick scan, um, or do I want to yeah, completely thoroughly examine the area to make sure that no one's going to be unintentionally harmed? Um, Perhaps yeah. So I think you could look at it from a 
from a benefit of the doubt point of view. I mean, when you, you were making your example, I started thinking that, again, this is a, a thought experiment, but what if we found out that contrary to our current expectations where we expect that something starts out with very limited consciousness and then it becomes richer. What if we actually found out that the, the, the conscious life of an embryo was even richer than our own? How would that then, uh, yeah. then change our obligations, if at all, to embryos? Uh, Bib, you're certainly right. And I mean, Thompson wrote her paper 50 years ago. I think there have been a lot of developments since then. She even says that at that point that she was, you know, it's surprising just how early um, a fetus develops human characteristics. Um, yeah, so I don't think I have a have a definite answer to that, but yeah. if, but yeah, I, I think I would say that if um, if there was a credible likelihood that there was this high, you know, high level of sort of consciousness or functioning you'd be wanting to examine it <laughs> and it would be a good incentive to, uh, yeah, to pursue that and try to get to the truth of the matter. Yeah. Although, although we don't worry about that high level of uh, rational thought in um, the minimally responsive patient. Um, it's different, I suppose, with a locked in patient, but um, someone, someone who's minimally responsive or uh, what's the other Sorry, not minimally responsive, but um, persistent vegetative state, which is not the term yeah. used anymore. But uh, mm -hmm. in, in we, we've discovered quite a bit about those states uh, where there's actually a lot more going on than we ever thought. Yeah. So I, sp I suppose that's the kind of what what how limited are we by our capacity to discover and in, in and and observe? Um, I. I I think you're certainly right about the the kinds of things being discovered about early embryonic life. It's actually quite mind blowing. Some of the self directional capacity, obviously not in terms of cognitive thought and so on, but maybe we'll learn about genetic memory and uh, uh, yeah. discover something that way. Anyway, no, I think that's a fair point. I think there's always a tendency to think that um, we now know more or less what we need to know, and that in the past yeah. everyone naive uh and, and I'm undoubtedly a generation from now people will be thinking that about us yeah um, yeah exactly which way it goes who knows but uh, no, i think it's a very fair question yes i mean this doesn't so much um uh relate to your paper as to the whole as to the whole sort of atmosphere in which in which these questions are often discussed but mm -hmm. I wonder if how much when we talk about the right to control your body, um, are we thinking about a world in which there are just there are no there are no parents, there are no carers, um, not just no pregnant women. You know, the, um, uh, the American legal scholar Erica Bakioki has talked about the autonomous male paradigm. So the person you imagine when you talk about rights is, is, is someone, you know, without ties, someone who decides where he goes and, and so on. But, you know, mo most of us, you know, when we think of parenthood, we wouldn't think that you had the right to control the body, your own body that was currently holding an infant. Uh, or as in Ilaria's scenario, if, if, if you're in an isolated area and you're, um, and, and you're the only person who can feed your baby because there is no formula, then most of us would think you know you didn't didn't have the right to control your body in that scenario yeah. so i wonder to what to what extent we're just imagining a world in which we're all um you know unconnected yeah. autonomous people uh, who don't have these very obvious obligations yeah. to 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 those close to us especially but also to others yeah you you're right if we i suppose you look at it a couple of ways one if we didn't have the um the moral obligation you'd hope we'd at least have the compassionate instinct uh, but yeah failing that i mean you're quite right um there have to be limitations to um you know, i think in some ways a right to do what i want with my own body my right to do what i want with my own body doesn't involve allowing me to form a fist and move it in the direction of someone else's face for, for example so i suppose there you'd be looking at something along the principle of you know we have the right to do what we want so long as it does not harm someone else uh, and then of course we have all the associated issues of um, what sort of harm counts. Is it you know, direct harm or is 
or, or not, um, you know, is my failing to be a good Samaritan a, um, a form of harming someone else? Uh, or is it only if I go out of my way and hurt you? Um, yeah, so I don't have an answer to that as such, but I, I think it's a, yeah, it's a very important, I think it's a very important question. I think Thompson, Thompson, I, I think, um, and I don't want to verbal her, I don't want to put sort of words in her mouth, but she talked about times where people had a right to do something when it would nevertheless be morally indecent if they did so. So she, for example, I mentioned um, a person, I think seven months pregnant who decided to have an abortion so she didn't have to postpone a European holiday. And Thompson was of the view that that would be quite an indecent act. But I think she still thought that even though it would be morally indecent decent and perhaps even morally reprehensible, it still doesn't mean that we'd have the right to force the woman not to have the abortion. So I think you can um, you can you can have both the, the idea where you're talking about, I mean, if you were talking about moral properties, I suppose you could have the the value properties, the ones that talk about whether an outcome is good or bad. And then you would have um, what you might call the more prescriptive properties that um, whether something is should be done or ought to be done or ought not be done. And so you might say that um, it's not a moral obligation of person A to look after person B. However, it is morally a good thing for person a to do that so you could um could look at it that way perhaps yeah i mean of course you need space for um for supererogation uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's certainly true um but most of us see lots and lots of cases particularly in 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 caring contexts where uh you, know, you simply have to go on holding that baby feeding that baby you know looking after your older older family member or whatever it is um, because that's a decent, a decent kind thing to do and, and um, uh, yes I, I wonder to what extent it's just artificial thinking uh, talking as if as if there's some kind of generic um, right to do what you like with your body I mean even mm. in relation to self-harm um, yes is there really a moral right to, to harm yourself well, it's not it's not clear mm. Yeah, that's right. Well, certainly um, there are legal limits on what's... I mean, I don't think it's an offence in most jurisdictions to harm yourself, but it's certainly um, accepted that um, people have a right to come in and stop you. That, um, you know, if, if you saw me on a ledge, it's, you're, you're within your rights to try to talk me down. And if you can't talk me down, to try to grab me down. Yes. I don't think anyone would um, hold that against you. Any final comments before we, um, we wrap up? Well, thank you very much, you know, for both for an interesting presentation and for a good, good discussion afterwards. And we're very, very grateful to you. Um, and Can I say it was absolutely my pleasure. Um, thank you again for having me and, uh, yeah, and, and for, your, for being so accommodating with the time too. That, uh, I, I really appreciate that. So yes, well, well, uh, at least, at least several of us here, here today are, are in fact Australian. So it's a great pleasure, a pleasure to yeah. be able to uh, do the Australians a, a favour too as a... As an Australian myself, although I live in I live in London, um, and on that point, can I just say I, I wrongly said at the beginning that this was our final uh, our final session of the calendar year, and and indeed it's not. And next Tuesday at the same time, uh, Dr. Greg Pike, who's with us today, will be presenting on um, feticide in in multiple multiple pregnancies. So that should be um, that should be a very interesting presentation, and that's at at nine thirty again uh, GMT. Um, so, um, and uh, I, I notice that Ilaria has, has given details on our, on our, on the fact that we're on Facebook and we're also available, available on Twitter too, at BioCenter UK. Um, yes, so, and where you can find all the details from, for, about our events. Uh, as yes, well. yes, yeah. exactly. So it's an easy way of, of, of sort of tuning into us and, um, and so on. So, um, so thank, thank you so much to everyone who was, uh, who, who was, uh, 
present today. And, and, and thank you again, Matthew, uh, for a very interesting presentation. Yes. My thank absolute you. pleasure. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Have a good day, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.